I want you to take a few seconds and picture Mother Teresa in your mind. There's a good chance that you imagined something like this. This is a classic picture of Mother Teresa in her old age. It captures well her deep joy, but also a sense of weariness from a lifetime serving the poorest of the poor in the slums of Calcutta. The image also communicates some things about Mother Teresa. The veil she wears is a part of her habit, indicating that she's a member of a religious order, the one that she founded, the Missionaries of Charity. That is, she was a nun. The second portrait communicates some of the same things about Mother Teresa. Once again, she's in her old age. She's also again in her habit. But the portrait has a very different vibe than the first one does. It shows a different side of Mother Teresa, namely the indignance she felt over the conditions of the Calcutta slums and the structures that caused those, those conditions to exist in the first place. This is indicated both by her expression, but also by the fact of the portrait being in black and white. This picture is also in black and white, but it again communicates something different. Here we see Mother Teresa as a young woman, but already in her habit. She committed to a missionary life early. Sensing a call at age 12, she left her parental home at the age of 18 to join a community of nuns. This final image of Mother Teresa is very different than the other. It's an icon and therefore has several symbolic features to it. The most significant of these is the halo that represents Teresa's sainthood as does also the fact that she is labeled Saint Teresa of Calcutta here. Teresa was canonized as a saint by the Roman Catholic Church in 2016. Each of these images communicates different things about Mother Teresa. But what if we wanted just one image that could capture all of the facets of her identity, life, and experiences? We might take pieces of each portrait and harmonize them into one in order to present who she is more fully. This, of course, does not work. By cropping out each image, we actually lose more than we gain. We create a monster Teresa portrait that obscures more than it reveals. And there are also things that the four images don't communicate about Mother Teresa, even when they aren't combined together, like the fact that Mother Teresa was a Nobel Prize winner. Every portrait of a person communicates something about them, but it cannot communicate everything about them. And we shouldn't expect a single harmonized image of a person to be able to communicate everything about them either. I'd like to propose that multiple different portraits of a person are helpful in better understanding that. Multiple portraits are able to highlight different characteristics about an individual. When these characteristics are viewed alongside other characteristics and compared with them, we understand that person better. But this isn't the same thing as combining the portraits into one image. That obscures more than it reveals. Rather, allowing each portrait to exist on its own not only helps us better understand a person, but it better allows us to see the creativity and interpretation of each artist which is to be celebrated. In short, multiple different portraits of a person isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing that reveals more about them. The same is true when it comes to Jesus. Multiple portraits of Jesus allow us to better understand Jesus' identity as well as his historical and theological significance. This doesn't mean that all portraits of Jesus are created equal or that for Christians every portrait of Jesus is canonical. But it does indicate that every portrait of Jesus, whether visual or in a text like the Gospels, is an artistic representation and interpretation of who Jesus is and was and how he is and was significant. The idea here is that there are multiple Jesuses. In this way, we can speak of the historical Jesus, the Jesus that some have attempted to get back to by stripping away the interpretive elements of the Gospel and New Testament authors to get back to the core of who Jesus was historically, what he did and what he said. This is one form of the so-called earthly Jesus, the presentation of the things that Jesus said and did while on earth, that is, those aspects of his human nature. In contrast is the exalted Jesus. Some New Testament texts will explicitly portray Jesus as an exalted entity, emphasizing his resurrection, ascension, and divinity.
Exalted versions of Jesus will identify Jesus with God. Jesus will be presented as a figure explicitly worshipped by humans, and elements of his divinity will be highlighted, such as his pre-existence. Whenever the ascended Jesus communicates with humans after his death, resurrection, and ascension, this is the exalted nature of Jesus being represented. Earthly versions of Jesus focus on Jesus' human characteristics and his time as a human on earth, such as when he weeps. This is, by the way, the shortest verse in the New Testament, John 11:35. Of course, many, if not most, New Testament authors present a Jesus who is simultaneously earthly and exalted, as in these two artistic portrayals. The left portrait portrays Jesus as gaunt and recently crucified, earthly features of him but also as triumphant over death, an exalted feature, as he carries the white banner and steps out of the grave. The icon on the right is meant to portray the two natures of Jesus, his divinity on the left and his humanity on the right as his face droops and darkens. While every New Testament text is concerned with Jesus and his earthly and exalted natures, every New Testament author does, doesn't combine these in the same way. They all create unique portraits. That is, each book of the New Testament has its own artistic and theological presentation of who Jesus is and how his life, death, ministry, resurrection, ascension, and divinity are significant. When it comes to the Jesus of the Gospels, there are some things that all of them seem to indicate about Jesus. First, none of the Gospels is at all concerned with what Jesus looked like. In no Gospel do we have a physical description of Jesus. Second, in all of the Gospels, Jesus has a rural, itinerant, and Jewish ministry. That is, he is traveling around, itinerant, largely in villages and not urban centers, rural, and proclaiming a message to his kinfolk, Jewish. While Jesus does interact with non-Jews or Gentiles in the Gospels, the focus of his ministry appears to be to other Jews, unlike Paul, the so-called apostle to the Gentiles. In all of the Gospels, most of Jesus' actions occur in the region of Galilee, though he travels to Jerusalem, outside of which he will ultimately be crucified and raised from the dead. Every portrayal of Jesus is unique. Having multiple versions of Jesus in the Gospels is to be celebrated. It's a good thing. We ought to resist the temptation to harmonize the New Testament's varying portrayals of Jesus, especially when it comes to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. While there are certainly central aspects of Jesus that are all of these texts are going to share in common, allowing each theological interpretation and depiction of Jesus to stand on its own better allows us to see Jesus' historical and theological significance.